Good morning, Ascent. Great to see everyone. Uh, my name is David Siegel. I'm the CEO of Meetup. Okay, just to get us started, how many of you have ever been to a Meetup event before? Raise your hand. Woo! Yes! I love it. Is there anyone here who's actually ever organized a Meetup event? Couple, one, two, about 10 of you here. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about um, the impact of community and, and what we do over at Meetup and making the most of the world's best tool for startups, which is about community. 46% of individuals recently identified themselves as lonely, according to a recent study. 25% of people we also said that they don't feel like they have a trusted confidant. That's actually up from only 10% of people just about a couple of decades ago. And 89% of people said that during their last social interaction, they were interrupted by their cell phones. How often is it that you're sitting in a restaurant, right? And you're seeing, uh, Mother and a daughter talking to each other, or a father and a son, or a father and a daughter talking to each other. And they're not talking to each other. They're sitting there, they're looking at their phones, and that's the, that's the extent of oftentimes their social interaction. And for us, there's one significant kind of antidote to all the kind of challenges around loneliness and the invasion of technology, and we love technology. Technology is, of course, a double-edged sword, right? We all know that. There are great parts, and there are challenging parts. What we do at Meetup is we use technology to get people off of technology. And the answer that we believe is community. Community is something that has changed um, the world and will continue to change the world. A little bit about our Meetup community. We have 44 million members, as you can see, and many of you are members of Meetup, and thank you for that. We have over 15,000 Meetup events every single day. We are in over 2,000 cities and across 190 countries. In fact, there's only two countries that we are not in right now. I didn't want to guess one of them. Just yell it out. Iraq is one of them, <laughs> and North Korea is a second country that we are not in. We are in every single country in the world, aside from, from those two countries, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's a great um, feeling to do things like in Havana, Cuba, where there's a startup ecosystem that is just in its nascent stages right now, there's a meetup group for startup founders. And in Iceland, there um, has been a meetup group and numerous meetup groups for a decade as they built out their startup and founder ecosystem in Iceland as well. Something that we're particularly proud of is the 14,000 women who are a part of the Women Who Code meetup um, that exists in New York and in hundreds of other locations all around the world. So in talking about community. There's a person here who could actually help us out a lot to teach us about how community can be used as a really important tool for all investors and or startup, startup founders and leaders in the room. And that person is none other than Mr. David Letterman. So anyone with a beard like that you know can be trusted. Am I right? So one of the things that I used to love about David Letterman was, what do you think it was? Just yell it out again. His, thank you, yes, his top 10, I didn't even plant that person. His top 10 lists. Um, I used to look forward to watching the top 10 lists and all the time. So what we are going to do today, right now, is a top 10 list of community strategies. Are you all ready? Okay, so because you're so ready, I just want to hear a drum roll, please, for number 10. Let's hear it. Drum roll right now. Okay, that was pretty good. We're going to do another drum roll after and expecting a little bit more, 
more, more, more knee slapping. Uh, so here we go. Number 10. Number 10 benefit of community is testing the viability of a product or business. So I actually teach also at Columbia University a course on entrepreneurship on the side. Um, and the book that we have everyone read in the course is a book that many of you have read. In fact, I bet half of the people in the room have read it. It's called The Lean Startup. Raise your hand if you read The Lean Startup. OK, awesome. If you haven't raised your hand right now, I beg of you, make sure you read The Lean Startup. It is a fundamental book for any entrepreneur, or anyone who's investing in entrepreneurs. The Lean Startup talks all about the importance of testing product viability, of building out an MVP, a minimum viable product. In Stockholm, for example, there is a test my product meetup group where founders attend the meetup group and they're actually testing each other's products for free um, and, and helping each other. Um, the importance of testing is that it gives real life, real in-person feedback. Obviously, we all know it reduces uncertainty. You have to know what you're doing before you're actually looking to raise capital. I was recently watching a video of none other than Brian Armstrong, who is the founder of, actually, say it again, anyone who Brian Armstrong is the founder of? No? OK, Coinbase is the answer, Coinbase. So he was talking about his early days and figuring out um, cryptocurrency. And he said, I had no idea what I was doing. So the first place that I went to to figure out and test my product was every single cryptocurrency and blockchain meetup that I could go to in order to figure out what to do. And then once I had a product, I just went around to different meetup groups and cryptocurrency and blockchain, and that's how I tested my product. So number 10, testing products. OK, let's see if we could do better for number nine. Number nine, drum roll again. OK, we got a, we got a woo woo, so that's, that's actually all the way better. Thank you. Number nine is fine. Did you know? that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they met at a meetup? OK, that's not true. They met like 30 years before a meetup even started. <laughs> that would be quite incredible, though. Um, but there are like thousands of founders that meet through community, that meet through community. And when I talk about community, I like to talk about a couple of different things. In fact, we actually even have a co-founder group in Palo Alto where people who are looking for a co-founder attend this particular meetup, and numerous companies have been founded through co-founders meeting each other, again, through community, through community. There's three things I like to talk about. The first is kind of the rule of 50. Rule of 50 is, you know, oftentimes what will happen for startup founders is they'll meet someone, they may fall in love, but as you may have been told by your parents, do not marry your first person you went on a date with, right? So it's so important to meet so many different people, meet dozens of different people, meet at least 50 different people um, as you are looking for kind of your key founders. Do not just kind of, I met someone, they're great, let's see what could happen. Rule of five is at minimum of five times to get together with them, whether it's coffee, whether it's at work settings, whether you could get angry at each other, that's actually a really good thing to have co-founders happen before you actually you know, align to, 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 move, to meet. I think one of the best examples of that in my experience, is you know Sheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg, who over a two or three year kind of wooing period, met dozens of times to actually really build a deeper relationship. And the last thing I, I would share is, is just the criticality when looking for a co-founder of complementary skills. You know, too often when I talk to my students, um, they're, you know, they're a very strong sales personality, and they look for someone similar to them because they can hit it off with that person. It's much easier to align with that person. And the most important thing is. When someone's extroverted, find someone who's more introverted, more thoughtful, uh, a slower decision maker, and the opposite of that as well. Again, community can be really impactful in terms of finding a business partner and co-founder. OK, number eight, driving debate and disagreement. Good decisions happen when you're surrounded by people who are different than you. Community fosters people who are different from each other. The best communities are people where people are truly coming in from diverse backgrounds. It's one of the reasons why in the workplace, diversity and inclusion is so important in kind of smart company decision making. Community 
helps to drive smarter decisions because it drives kind of less groupthink, more nonlinear decision making. Obviously then, for founders, for investors, it increases the likelihood that a company is going to ultimately pivot. So in the book that I referenced up front about Lean Startup, one of my favorite stories in the book, and for founders, please take note here, is of a, of a startup company, and every single month, they had a meeting in the calendar called the Pivot Meeting. And it was so important to them to have a set time that they were going to question every assumption that they had made beforehand and to determine if what they're thinking right now is, is consistent with what they had been thinking two months, three months, six months, a year ago. That pivot meeting only comes through through debate and disagreement, and ultimately, community can drive that. Number seven, here we go, recruiting. So we actually have um, numerous kind of partnerships with dozens of different companies that work with Meetup to help in recruiting. So an example of that would be um, Tim Hortons and Burger King. They've said it isn't easy to find engineers. We all know how challenging it is, and a lot of engineers want to work for startups like some of you, or for investors like many of you. And it may not be as sexy, but actually they're doing incredibly interesting things. They're figuring out the, the, the balance between retail and commerce and e-commerce, et cetera. So they asked us to set up a big recruiting event for, to help them to find ta top tech talent. And it's an example of where community can be leveraged very significantly in recruiting. I know a number of HR leaders who will go to engineering uh, meetup events. They'll go to sales meetup events, and they'll leverage kind of that community for recruiting. Whether it's meetup or not meetup, leveraging your internal community to drive recruiting for top talent, for your leadership team, incredibly important in terms of helping to um, build the, the team that you need in your future. So that's number seven. Here we go. Number six, let's talk about training and the power of, of, of Meetup to help, a, a community, excuse me, community to help in training. Everyone learns in different ways. Everyone learns in different ways. There's some people, they're sitting here listening to me and they're hopefully learning something. And that's great. But there are also some people in the room that are, you know, might be on their phones, which is, you know, normal. <laughs> but there's also some people in the room that don't learn this way. The way that they learn is from peer-to-peer -peer interactions. The way that they learn is by having one-on-one -on -one type conversations with people. And what community can foster is possibly some of the best training that could happen. Now, we have training that exists on everything from learning to code to learning Swahili. We actually have that. And people learn from each other and they get together in groups and they're learning with each other and they're learning different languages. And it's a real, you know, really beautiful thing. But companies can do the same. Especially if you're a cash-strapped startup. And by the way, most startups are. <laughs> a great way to reduce costs is to understand some of the great skills that people in your employee community have and figure out how to leverage those skills across all the rest of the organization. So one of the things that we used to do is we actually asked all employees to list out the things that they wanted to learn the most. And there'd be everything from um, learning to code to learning how to make a great guacamole. You know, everything was out there. And then we'd find employees who had a passion for making great guacamole or learning the basics of coding. Uh, and, and we used our employee population to really drive peer learning. A company that does this exceptionally well, exceptionally well, is Tesla. Tesla really focuses on leveraging kind of their peer network um, to drive community and training and learning. Okay, we'll do a couple more. No, another, another one for number five. Here we go, influencer marketing. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Woo, okay. Wow, that, that was like so overpowering. <laughs> Feeling the love. So number five is about influencer marketing. I think one of the best examples of companies that are exceptional at influencer marketing 
is Lululemon. Lululemon realized that they could tap into community to build out their business in really interesting ways. They had something called brand ambassadors, who were mostly yoga instructors, Pilates instructors, et cetera. And they would go to the yoga instructors and Pilates instructors and say, hey, you know this amazing, um, I don't know, what do people use in yoga? Yoga pants, thank you. OK, oh, that's a great name. You know these amazing yoga pants? Well, for only at Lululemon, I guess $300 or whatever the cost is. <laughs> um, um, they would give the, the yoga pants at either discounted rates or for free to yoga instructors. And then after the class, people would walk over to yoga instructors, wow, those yoga pants, look at how they stretch across the knee. I wish I had yoga pants like that. That's amazing. Where did you get that? Lululemon. So they used their community to drive influencer marketing. Actually, a more modern example of that company is Peloton. Peloton has done an exceptional job of building relationships between their instructors and, um, and the individuals who are their followers. And it's a modern day example of leveraging community around influencer marketing. Moving to number four is something that starts with an R and it ends in a UE, and it's pretty damn important to a lot of people in this room. And what is it? Revenue. It's revenue. OK, so community can help to build your revenue. Use community to drive revenue growth. So a specific example of that is there's a company called Flatiron, the Flatiron School, where they teach coding skills and teach data science skills. So it's, it's a great company. Um, also owned by WeWork, I may add, so a sister company of ours. And um, one of the things, ways we work with them is they will, um, provi they will provide kind of really thoughtful leadership to a meetup group uh, around data science or engineering. And that group potentially can turn into future people who want to go to the Flatiron School. So they're using it for lead generation. They're using it to drive kind of acquisitions in their business. They're using it to drive new clients. They're using it to drive new sponsors. They're using it to drive new partnerships. Um, community can do all of those things. And whether you do it on your own or you do it with another partner like us or someone else, community can really help you with a big, all-important revenue. Number three, power users. So it's actually been said that one power user in some, in some organizations can truly be worth not just 10x, not even 100x, but 1,000x the value a regular standard user. So for example, um, we have you know, a lot of different, 1,200 different companies, whether it's Slack who has community groups with Meetup, or whether it's AWS, or whether it's um, Google who has over 1,000 Meetup groups as well. What, what these organizations do is they recognize that community can help them build power users. And what Google does, by the way, is they fly in thousands of individuals who are their zealous power users, and they spend a day or two up at Google's headquarters to um, help them with different focus groups, to help them think about their products. It's these power users, these influencers, not famous influencers like in the Lululemon examples, but these influencers that can really drive your business. And businesses and startups that focus on building the, the best products that they can for their power user audiences are businesses that will ultimately likely thrive in the future. Speaking of growth, I thought this would be interesting to just see. It's impossible to read what this actually means, but I'll just tell you. What it means actually is that 1% of our meetup groups represent 30% of our RSVPs. Amazing thing. And the 50% of our bottom groups represent less than 5% of our RSVPs. So it's a typical power user curve, which you know certainly exists in Twitter. I can think of one person who tweets a lot and is responsible for lots of, lots of activity on Twitter. Shall remain nameless, but I think you know who I'm referring to. Um, going to number two. Community can be leveraged to help to make smart, strategic business decisions around things like geographic expansion, even. So for example, we thought you might find this interesting. It's looking at the number of meetup groups that focus on emerging technologies and how those groups have grown over the last four or five years. 
There was an article actually in The Economist about it pretty recently. And what it shows you is you see the little inflection for Paris or for Tel Aviv. Over from 17 to 18, there was a very significant growth in both Paris and also Tel Aviv in the number of groups focused on emerging technology. As one thinks about what geographies to expand to in your technology, think about how community and the existing startup ecosystem in those locations can help you to really build your businesses. Now we got to do our last and real great one for last drum roll to hear number one, the number one reason about how why community can significantly impact. Let's hear it now. Drum roll, please. OK. Number one is all about community being the fabric that connects personal and professional relationships. I have been working for 23 years. I've had seven different jobs. It doesn't, not so bad to say seven jobs. I guess it's an average of three years per job. I, I was worried about sharing all that data, all that information. It looked like I jumped around too much. Three years is, is you know, respectable. Every single one of my seven jobs have co has come in one way, shape, or form through some form of community, some form of uh, a relationship that I was able to cultivate uh, most often in a larger kind of group setting. It could have come from a community from an employee group that I was a part of when I was employees or a community with a parent-teacher association that I've been a part of. But the, the mixing of the personal and professional is, is real. These individuals might be going hiking, but two of them might be into tech, and one of them might now become a client of the other person. And those are the kind of things that happen when you, when you kind of blend the personal and professional. I talked about the, the class at Columbia that I, I taught, or I teach, excuse me. And in the class is a whole bunch of standard books that you would expect to see in like an entrepreneurship class. The Hard Thing About Hard Things, and Lean Startup, and Running Lean, and those kind of books, negotiations books. There's one book, however, that every single time I have a class, people are like, why the heck is this book in our entrepreneurship class. This doesn't make sense. And the book is by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a good book, right? So the reason why that book is in there, because that book is all about kind of EQ. That book is all about building relationships. The book is all about an understanding that if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking to build the best management team and recruit top talent and sell investors and build relationships with investors, and um, ultimately build a great business. It's about combining the personal and the professional, which is really what great communities can ultimately foster. So this is a list of the top 10 in a summary list over here. I'm not going to read them back to you, but you could, you know, you could you hopefully remember that list. And if you don't want to have to remember that list, because who needs to remember anything these days? You could just send me an email. So easy, right? So just email me at david at meetup.com. Um, we can send you a copy of this PowerPoint presentation. If that's helpful, I'll just leave you with the following statement, which is, you know, within New York City, we've got uh, tons of different startup founder groups. Um, so this one happens to have 700 members in it. The Test My Product one in Stockholm, Sweden. And if you could have an excuse to go to Stockholm, Sweden, Go to Stockholm, Sweden, with 400 members in it, and AWS in Palo Alto with 3,000 members in that particular group. So there's, again, here's my information. Um, if there's anything that will be helpful, then feel free to send me a note. I genuinely hope that this is somewhat helpful. I envision a world in the future where much like startup founders have an expert in SEO and an expert in paid marketing and an expert in product management, expert in design, at some point in the future, there'll be a realization about the power of community and the power of a kind of a community strategist. And I take the most advantage of that. And obviously, that would be a really exciting thing um, for Meetup as an organization. And more importantly, I think for the impact that it could have on the numbers that we started with, which is that 46% loneliness, that 25% um, uh, lack of a, of a, a camaraderie and the 89% of people whose, whose interactions 
are, are interrupted through cell phones. And that would make for a better world. Take care, everyone.